Hey, today we're going to be reading chapter 12 of Seraphina and the Twisted Staff with the permission of Scholastics as we are um, continuing with our distance learning. So this is chapter 12, Seraphina and the Twisted Staff. Seraphina flew down the stairway, barely touching every fifth step. One flight, two flights, three flights down, hitting the main floor. She dashed past the startled footman at the butler's pantry door, then headed down the narrow passage through another door across the breakfast room then another corridor, and finally stopped, took a breath, and stepped calmly into the winter garden. Tall dangling palms, ficus trees, and other exotic plants filled the room. Sunshine poured down through the arched dome of the ornate beams that held the winter garden's glass ceiling aloft. Fine pieces of ceramic art were displayed on the small viewing stands throughout the tiled room, and French rattan furniture provided places for the fancy folk to lounge. She had come here to this central room in the house, hoping to meet Brayden before being questioned by the investigator. But she felt so vulnerable walking openly in this grand place, where once she had only prowled. She kept checking for places to hide, her muscles pulsing, first this way, then that, as if she'd need to flee at any moment. Then she spotted Brayden and the English girl standing together. Seraphina hesitated. Her body tensed. The two citizens of the upstairs had ex had changed out of their riding outfits, he into his afternoon black coat, trousers, and tie, and she into a sky-blue dress with a narrow waist corset, cap puffy sleeves, and silk chiffon covering her forearms. The girl's chestnut red tresses were piled up high on her head, swept back in soft, neat waves, held in place by a twang, uh, sorry, a twined wooden shawl pin, then spilling down on one side in the twisted rolls, sausage curls, so tight and perfectly formed, they reminded Serafina of coiled springs in her pa's workshop. Whoever they had assigned to be the girl's lady, lady's maid that afternoon must have spent hours curling her hair with a fire-heated curling iron. Serafina had guessed before that the girl was about 14 years old, but she could now see that she was clearly trying to act older. She wore finely wrought dangling silver earrings and a black velvet ribbon choker necklace with a cameo pendant. Serafina had to admit that she was an elegant looking girl with striking eyes, the color of the forest. As Serafina stepped closer to them, her heart pounded far harder than if she had been, had been entering a battle with the wolfhounds. She's nervous. Out of habit, she walked silently. Neither of the humans noticed her, but Gideon's sharply pointed black ears perked up, then dropped down in relief when he recognized her. He wagged his tail nub excitedly. Serafina smiled, warmed by the dog's enthusiasm. The English girl was facing in Serafina's direction, but she didn't take notice of her until it became quite obvious that Serafina was walking straight toward them. The girl was clearly startled by Serafina's appearance. Her eyes widened and she tilted her head. She looked almost scared. But as Serafina came closer, the girl seemed to compose herself more firmly. She looked at Serafina with a withering gaze, as if to say, why in the world would someone dressed like that be walking towards someone dressed like me? If you don't like this, you should have seen what I was going to wear, Serafina thought, passing just short Oh, sorry, pausing just short of them, Serafina stood between the bronze fountain in the center of the room and a beautiful blue and white Ming vase on a small wooden table beneath a collection of graceful palms. Serafina remembered overhearing that Mr. Vanderbilt had purchased the vase on his travels to the Orient, that it was over 400 years old and one of the most valuable works of art in the house. Serafina said, stood so, so still and out in the open for, that for a moment she almost felt like one of the pieces of furniture. When Brayden finally saw her there, his face lit up and he smiled. Hello, Serafina, he said without hesitation. Serafina's body filled with a wave of relief and happiness. Hello, Brayden, she said, hoping she sounded at least somewhat normal. Even though he should have been expecting her, Brayden seemed so surprised and happy to see her there. Had he been worried about her? Or was it simply because she so seldom visited the main floor in the daytime? I, she began, not sure how to say it properly. I am in receipt of your note, she said, trying to sound as sophisticated as possible, but wanting to make it clear she understood the seriousness of the interrogation. 
He nodded knowingly, stepped toward her, and spoke to her in a low voice. I don't know what we're walking into here, but I think we need to be very careful. What's the investigator's name, she asked. Where does he come from? I don't know, Braden said. He came late last night. And what does your uncle say about all this? If the authorities determine that Mr. Thorne was murdered, then the murderer will be hanged. He actually said that, Serafina asked, taken aback. But even as she and Brayden talked, she felt the air bristling around her. When Brayden first saw her and greeted her with such warmth, she had noticed that the English girl stepped back a little, her chin raised and her face tense with uncertainty. Now she was just standing there, waiting quietly. The situation was becoming increasingly awkward for her. Brayden should have been introducing her, but he wasn't. He seemed to have forgotten her. Serafina couldn't, couldn't imagine that was a pleasant feeling. It dawned on her that the girl might be as uncomfortable with her surroundings at Biltmore as Serafina was. The girl was a newcomer, still trying to find her place to fit in. And now here she was, I'm sorry, and now here was the one boy she knew whispering with some strange, shaggy-haired, tooth-marked vagrant. Despite the sharpness Serafina had felt for the girl the first time she saw her, she almost felt sorry for her. Oh, yes, Brayden said, seeming to read Serafina's mind and suddenly remember his responsibilities. Serafina, this is... But at that moment, Mrs. Vanderbilt came sweeping down the steps into the winter garden. Ah, I see you're all here. Good. I'll take you down to the library to speak with Mr. Vanderbilt and the detective. The lady of the house wore a handsome afternoon dress, and she was putting on a good front. But Serafina could see she did, she did indeed look a bit peaked. Her cheeks were pale, but her, brown, her brow was flushed. She seemed to be trying to soldier on through her day with a positive attitude, despite her poor health. Serafina, before we go down, I would like you to meet someone, Mrs. Vanderbilt said, bringing her with a soft gesture of her hand toward the English girl. I would like to present Lady Rowena Fox Pemberton, who is visiting us from very far away. I hope the two of you can become good friends during her time here at Biltmore. We must all we must do all we can to make her feel as if Biltmore is her home. I'm glad to meet you, miss, Serafina said politely to the girl. My lady, Lady Rowena said as she looked at Serafina up and down in surprise. Excuse me? Serafina asked, genuinely confused. You're to address me, not as miss, but as my lady, Lady Rowena corrected Serafina in her formal English accent. I see, Serafina said. Is that how they do it in England? And will you be addressing me as my lady also then? Of course not, the girl said in astonishment as color rose to her cheeks. All right, Mrs. Vanderbilt said, reaching out and touching each of the girls with an open hand in an attempt to smooth over the situation. I'm sure we'll get the English-American relations sorted out. But as Mrs. Vanderbilt reached gently toward her, Serafina reflexively stepped back and felt the brush of a tall, dangling palm frond against her cheek. The palm leaf seemed to actually move of its own accord and get tangled in her hair. Startled, Serafina reached up and spun quickly to brush it away thinking that it must be a tree snake or something, for that was exactly how it felt. She snapped around so fast that she bumped into the furniture behind her. Oh, do be careful there, Serafina, Mrs. Vanderbilt cried out in panicked dismay, reaching towards the thing behind Serafina. That was when Serafina realized that her sudden movement had bumped the small wooden stand that held the Ming vase. The vase tipped off the stand and fell. Serafina watched in horror as the priceless piece of art plummeted towards the hard tiled floor. She tried to reach for it, but she was too late. It hit the floor and crashed and shattered into a thousand pieces. The sight of the exploding porcelain took Serafina's breath away. The sound of it echoing through the house churned a sickness in her stomach. Everyone stared at the shattered vase in shock and then looked at her. Serafina's cheeks burned with heat, and her eyes filled with tears. I'm so, so sorry, Mrs. Vanderbilt, she said, moving toward her. I, I didn't mean to do that. I'm so sorry. Maybe we can glue it, Brayden said, dropping to his knees and trying to pick up the shards, as Lady Rowena Fox Pemberton stared balefully at Serafina and shook her head as if to say, I knew you didn't belong in the house. George is going to be heartbroken, Mrs. Vanderbilt muttered to herself, her hand over her mouth as she st uh, stared in stunned disbelief at the broken pieces on the floor. 
It was one of his favorites. I'm so sorry, Serafina said again, her heart filled with an aching, shameful pain. I don't know what happened. The plant attacked me. But even as the words slipped out of her mouth, she knew how immature they sounded. Lady Rowena just stared at her, taking it all in, too smart and well-poised to actually smile, but seeming to be on the edge of it. Seraphina looked around her at the plants and the other objects in the room. She didn't understand it. She had spent her whole life prowling in this house, ducking and darting, and never once had she ever knocked over or broken anything. And now, just as she was starting to come out into the upstairs world, just as she was wanting to show Mrs. Vanderbilt how much she appreciated her friendship, she did this horrible, stupid, clumsy thing. She wanted to run back down to the basement and cry. It took every ounce of her courage to remain standing there in shame. Finally, Mrs. Vanderbilt looked at her nephew kneeling on the floor trying to clean up the mess. Brayden, she said, I'm afraid it's not going to work. Sensing the gravity of his aunt's mood, Brayden slowly stopped his efforts. You do not have time for this, Mrs. Vanderbilt said. You and Serafina are expected to speak with Detective Grayson. Serafina had never seen Mrs. Vanderbilt act so cold and businesslike to Brayden or anyone else, and it was totally her fault. I'll take Lady Rowena for a walk to the conservatory, Mrs. Vanderbilt said. You and Serafina go down to the library immediately. Mrs. King, the head housekeeper, entered the winter garden and spoke directly to Mrs. Vanderbilt. I've asked a maid to get the broom and dustpan to sweep up the broken vase, she said, her voice level and professional. As the highest ranking servant at Biltmore, the matron possessed a commanding presence. Wearing a practical olive green dress and a mother of pearl buttons and a sash around her waist, she kept her hair pulled back in a tightly controlled bun behind her head. Thank you, Mrs. King, Mrs. Vanderbilt said appreciatively. Please take the children to the library. When Mrs. Vanderbilt called her and Brayden children, Serafina saw the satisfaction in Lady Rowena's face. Come this way, Mrs. King instructed Brayden and Serafina. It was the kind of voice that was used to being obeyed. Mrs. King had been running Biltmore for years, even before Mr. Vanderbilt married and Mrs. Vanderbilt arrived. As Serafina followed the matron through the entrance hall, she wiped her teary eyes and tried to think about, about what her pa would tell her at this moment. Quit your sniffling and get your wits about you, girl, he'd say, and he'd be right. If she was going to be questioned by an investigator for a murder that she'd been a part of, she was going to have to pull herself together. Seravina studied Mrs. King as she followed her down the long length of the tapestry gallery toward the library, for she seldom had been this close to her. One of the things that had always mystified Serafina about Mrs. King was that she lived in an area of Biltmore that Serafina had never seen. She was the one and only inhabitant of the mysterious second and a half floor. Serafina couldn't imagine how a whole floor, or even half of one, could exist between two other floors, but she'd learned long ago that all manner of both grand and wicked things were possible at Biltmore. The plant, I'm sorry, the palm trees, for example, were particularly untrustworthy. She couldn't help but notice the key ring hanging on Mrs. King's sash. It was a large brass ring with all the keys in the house for every door, cupboard, and secret hatch from the basement to the top floor. Serafina had always been mesmerized by the jingling, jangling sound of the hanging keys. But just as she was looking at it, something tiny pulled a key from the ring darted down Mrs. King's dress and shot along the floor quicker than two blinks and a sneeze. The brown little creature had been so small and had moved so fast that Serafina barely saw it, and she was quite sure that no one else had, but she'd been CRC long enough to know what it was, a mouse. Sometimes mice move so fast that they're just a flash and then they're gone. Already she started doubting that she'd actually seen it. How in the world could a live mouse run down Mrs. King's dress? And what was it doing? Stealing a key to the cheese cupboard? But she had a bigger problem to face. She, as, sorry, as she and Brayden plodded along behind Mrs. King, Serafina looked over at Brayden. His lips were pressed together, his face filled with worry. It felt like Mr. King was, I'm sorry, Mrs. King was taking her and Brayden to their trial, sentencing, and execution. She had half a mind to turn and run just get out of there while she still had the chance. 
She'd be as gone as yesterday's breeze before Mrs. King even noticed she was missing, but she knew she couldn't leave poor Brayden behind, so she trudged glumly along beside him, not knowing what else to do. She felt like she was tied up in a poke sack and was about was just about to get chucked into the river. As they entered the library, Serafina gazed across the fam familiar room. Thousands of Mr. Vanderbilt's leather-bound books lined the walls of intricately carved wood and sculpted marble work. The books reached all the way up to the angelic Italian painting on the ceiling, some 35 feet above their heads. But there was no one in the room. The globes of the brass lamps were lit, and the fire a fire burned in the massive black marble fireplace, but the library room was completely empty. When she glanced at Brayden, it was clear that he was as confused as she was, but the stalwart Mrs. King appeared undeterred. undeterred. She led them along the bookcases built into the western wall, and then turned right and stopped. And, and sorry, They were now looking at a section of the room's oak paneling. It took Serafina nearly a second to recognize that it wasn't just a wall, it was a door. And the carving on the door center panel is what disturbed her, a robed man holding a finger to his mouth as if to say, shh. There was blood dripping down his head and a knife stuck in his back. You may step through the door, the matron said. They are expecting you. Dun dun dun. <laughs>